everyone. Welcome to our final presentation in the Northwest eLearn 2020 conference webinar series. We have two presenters in this session, Dr. Valda Arnold from Blue Mountain Community College and Dr. Yongsheng Sun from Columbia Basin College. Valda and Yongsheng are going to discuss um, teaching emotional intelligence online with a focus on the sociology of discussion boards. We also have Anna Thompson and Jerry Lewis join me today as co-hosts. The three of us will help monitor the chat and Q&A area. You are all muted during the, during the webinar, but if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, um, please feel free to send them our way. We don't have closed captioning for the live event, but closed captioning will be added in post-production. Okay, Velda and Yongsheng, the floor is yours. Thank you, Weiwei. Thank you, Weiwei. So let's first talk about student engagement in discussions. I've noticed over the years teaching emotional intelligence that the students uh, really do get engaged in the discussions. And when I was talking uh, with Yung Shin, I, we were questioning whether it's a topic or the modality uh, that gets them to be so engaged. And then uh, since he's a sociologist, we were also talking about some of the theories about why students would be engaged in an online discussion and what do we know about those theories that can help us improve our online uh, communications. So before we get started talking about the theories, I want to talk about emotional intelligence in case you don't know what it's about. So this is a, a subject I've been teaching for 10 or so years and what it has to do with um, understanding and regulating your emotions. So instead of just reacting to something, you actually think about it and, and you choose how to react or how to not react. Um, and community college, I teach at a community college. Community college students are primarily not, not familiar with emotional intelligence at all. And so this is something brand new to them and uh, they find it interesting right away. I. Um, the, the main po components of it are to be aware of your emotions. That's the hardest part. That's the very first part. Awareness is always uh, what you need to do to change something. Once you're aware of your emotions and how you act and react and how you feel or don't feel, uh, then the next thing is learning how you manage those emotions. Uh, we also cover emotional triggers. If any of you have siblings, you know about emotional triggers. Those are the buttons that your siblings or your parents or uh, your kids uh, push to get you to react certain ways. And our final outcome is uh, learning how we can relate better with other people, work together better um, and get along. So my intelligence, emotional intelligence course, we have weekly readings on the concepts. Uh, so those are you know, overviews. And then I give them activities. So sometimes we do online assessments, um, but primarily I have them doing observations. And even during uh, the pandemic, uh, I have observations that they can do. They can watch TV shows. They can watch um, you know, TED Talks. They can watch all sorts of movies. Uh, I've ruined some people watching movies uh, with this course too. And then I have discussion boards every week, um, videos, video reflections. And I added those to the course. Uh, this course was originally one credit. Students, after a couple terms, said they wanted more. So I add, they added these video reflections so that they get a different perspective. Uh, a lot of students aren't familiar with TED Talks. They learn to love them, and they actually seek out more TED Talks to learn more about the subject. And then finally, there are journals. The journals are private, one-on-one -on -one communication with me, and students can share I, there's always prompts. There's prompts for the discussion board. There's prompts for the journals. But students are free to share whatever they want with me in their journals. So the role of the discussion board in my classes, I look at it as small group discussions. If you had a face-to-face -face class and you would break students up in small groups to discuss things, that's how I see discussion boards. And that works if, if you require them to uh, communicate with each other. It gives students a chance to share their thoughts. So you just uh, read about a new concept, or you watched a video on a new concept. Being able to share what you thought, what your takeaways were, that's very, very powerful. And it gives students these aha moments that they, sometimes a lot of students 
think that they're the only one. I'm the only one who thinks this. I'm the only one who feels this. And when you're in a discussion and you realize that there are other students who think or feel the same way, it's, aha, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. So Yongsheng, on to you. Hi, my name is Yongsheng and I teach intercultural studies and sociology at Columbia Business College. So what is the sociology of discussion boards? What do sociological theories have to say about discussion boards? In order to answer those questions, we need to first touch on some sociological conceptions and understandings of the theory of micro-sociology, the compulsion of proximity and socialization factors. Next slide, please. First, micro-sociology. As we know, sociology is the scientific study of humans in relation to the society. Micro-sociology is the study of everyday human life, human life behaviors, and face-to-face -face social interactions. It was first coined in the 1950s by sociologist Harold Garfinkel, uh, who described this term in his study that focused on individual interactions and communications. Another name I'd like to introduce to you is uh, <coughs> sociologist Erwin Goffman, um, whose study uh, focused on social interactions and the socialization. Talking of Goffman, uh, it's kind of funny that people in Canada tend to call him the Canadian sociologist, Irvin Goffman, and here in the US, he's known as the Canadian-born American sociologist. Anyway, um, Goffman believes it is important to study the little things in human interactions and socialization because they allow us to have a better understanding of human behaviors and thus give us opportunities to act creatively in shaping our environment. Now, it is important to keep this concept in mind because everything I will be talking about in this presentation is within this framework of microsociology and human interactions, which focuses on which focus on the little things, the mundane things people do and have in daily life, such as daily conversations and, uh, you guessed it, discussions as we see in online discussion boards. They all go together in explaining the sociology of discussion boards. Next slide, please. So um, today we have internet, email, social media, and more and more people are interacting online rather than face to face. Would social media and the electronic communication replace human face to face interactions? In their study, uh, sociologist uh, uh, Deirdre Holden and, uh, and Harvey Mullock asked, how far can electronic communication substitute for face-to-face -face interaction? And the compulsion of proximity concept came into being. The compulsion of proximity is the argument that humans have a na natural, true natural need for personal interactions in their presence. Humans need to socialize and interact in order to live happily, <clears throat> efficiently. And it is in people's well-being to share ideas and connect with other people. By the way, Bolden and uh, Malak concluded in their study that uh, there is no substitute for human face-to-face -face interactions. Next slide, please. We all know in our daily face-to-face -face interactions and socialization that there are always people who tend to dominate, right? And there are always people who get dominated. And even before, well, let me say it again. 
Well, there are people who get dominated and even become marginalized. And people who are marginalized tend to feel disconnected and isolated or even feel fear to socialize. In a face-to-face -face setting, of course, we can see who is dominating and who is dominated and who is marginalized in the class and we can intervene as educators accordingly to ensure inclusive student engagement and smooth student participation in the classroom. But that is hard to do in an online class setting and modality. Since we do not see students in action and cannot tell as easily as we would in a face-to-face <coughs> -face setting. And, and COVID-19 has made people especially more stressed out and isolated than before. There's actually now a so-called COVID syndrome that has nothing to do with the virus itself, but everything to do with its negative impact on human emotional, mental, and psychological well-beings. So with that sociological understanding, how do we better promote student engagement in online classes? One answer is through the use of discussion boards and the understanding of emotional intelligence. When we talk about using discussion boards to remedy online student isolation and disconnect, there are quite a few advantages of discussion boards in online classes, especially in dealing with the fear of socialization and possible isolation. For example, people who can focus purely just on the content of the message and not get distracted as in a face-to-face -face setting, right? People who are shy or not as confident, people who are from traditionally disadvantaged groups such as women and uh, marginalized groups such as ESL students and uh, those people who are introverts may get empowered and liberated and speak more freely behind the computer screen than they would otherwise. This is where emotional intelligence considerations come into play too. Students who have a better understanding of their emotions tend to have a better chance in controlling their emotions, have more empathy and connecting with others because they see other people may be going through the same thing. Discussion boards actually may forge or um, enhance stronger social interaction and integration since people communicate purely on each other's views and common interests. And that builds better engagement, better trust, and better relationships. They are especially true in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. The symbolic interactionist approach regarding online discussions, socialization, and student behaviors. So, putting everything I have said here together, online discussion boards, student socialization, and behaviors can be easily understood through the symbolic interactionist approach, which focuses on small groups of people and on small things. Humans are social creatures and socialize as we all do. And social interaction is just part of our everyday life. We humans have a true natural need for social, for social interactions, as I mentioned earlier. People may feel a sense of emptiness or even despair if not having been heard by or having listened to somebody else. The symbolic interactionist approach was developed by early sociologist George Herbert Mead. This is a theoretical approach that emphasizes on 
the role of language and symbols in analyzing the social world. Mead argued that all human interactions involve an exchange of symbols and a complex and subtle process of symbolic interaction shapes our interactions. I meant the, the complex process of symbolic interpretation shapes our interactions. We see ourselves as others see us. According to symbolic interactionist approach, social life is constructed through the interactions of individuals and those interactions gain meaning and reflect back to shape the behaviors of the individuals in our everyday life. We gain perspectives and adjust our behaviors and the mentality, of course, based on our socialization and interactions with others. So having that understanding is vital in our efforts to uh, provide adequate opportunities for our students to interact and socialize in our online classes with the use, of course, of discussion boards. And the understanding of emotional intelligence helps us improve our online teaching and maximize our online communication effectiveness. Understanding of emotional intelligence helps us better serve our students in teaching and learning as people better regulate and better manage their emotions and appreciate other people's points of views in their participation of the discussion board activities. So when students better understand and better manage their own emotions, <coughs> they tend to connect with others better. They tend to have more empathy. They tend to be more positive, which all lead to better engagement in the discussions and the classes. I talked earlier about the advantages of discussion boards. What happens is discussion boards allow students to remain in the backstage in, instead of risking their possibility instead of risking the possibility of ruining their expected or preferred personal image in, in the front stage, as we say in sociology. So this takes away the student's possible nervousness and uneasiness. That, therefore, makes personal impression management a lot easier. You see, students have time to think about and compose first what they wanted to say and then response in a later time of their own choice in discussion boards, right? The much aligned and, and well-designed discussion boards can therefore help people avoid the detrimental effects of social isolation and possible social intimidation when taking online classes, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. So using the symbolic interactionist theory, we can see students getting into a new form of interaction through discussion boards, getting influenced by their classmates and peers, attached meanings and values to the substance and behaviors of each other and reshape their own behaviors and images in the process. By participating in this new form of social interaction, instead of face-to-face, -face, of course, students create and make meanings in their interactions and get a sense of belonging, uh, affiliation, and even personal identification in the process. As I mentioned earlier, the feedback and interpretations students receive from their peers in the discussions come around to 
reinforce and shape and enhance their own self awareness, their own self consciousness, and their own self esteem. So students, therefore, will feel more willing and more interested in engaging in online discussions that are well designed with emo emotional intelligence considerations. I mentioned earlier that if students can understand and manage their own emotions better, they will connect with others better and they will be more positive engaging in the discussions and the classes overall. And that is exactly what we as educators want because it is all about increasing student engagement and understanding in our online settings. Um, Dr. Arnold will talk about well-designed discussion boards next. Okay, thank you. So what is a well-designed discussion board? First of all, it has to be a part of the class. You can't just have it out there. Uh, you know, if you want to discuss something, here's a place you can do it. Uh, make it graded, make it required. If it's not graded, uh, who's going to do it? Uh, that the grades are what motivates students to do things. So make sure it's part of the class graded. It should also be related to the content of the class. You want students in the discussion boards to think, uh, to not just regurgitate, you know, you, you wouldn't put up a prompt, what is two plus two? That's not deep thinking. They already know it's four and you don't want to have 30 students typing four. So make sure it's related to the content of the class and encourage them to think. So you should, uh, there's some discussion on whether you should let students post a discussion prompt or whether uh, the instructor should post. I believe that the instructor should post. If you have students posting within one discussion board, it becomes fractured and you can't really follow threads really well. If you've gotten in there and tried to follow a discussion, you know, students reply to students and then if there's another question, it gets to be quite a mess. So. I suggest that the faculty uh, come up with a prompt and, they, and then that way they can organize the responses. Make sure it's directed, orderly, clean. And you need to set parameters. What are the expectations you have for the students? In my courses, I tell them they're supposed to answer the prompt. Uh, it needs to be two paragraphs, not two sentences. And I give them a deadline for when they're supposed to post. Then they're supposed to read and respond to at least two others. And then I give them a deadline for that. So make sure you're really clear. Also give uh, points for that. You know, you don't get 100 points if you just, or 100% if you just put, answer the prompt. You have to also look at your classmates. That's forcing them to have a discussion. And I think that's really important. Otherwise you get students just posting and nobody reads anything else. So what is your role as the faculty person? So I already told you that in my courses, I see discussion boards as small group discussions. So I'm not gonna get in the middle of their discussion. If you are the kind of faculty who would walk around in a classroom, get in the middle of a student's discussion, feel free to do that. That's not how I normally do things. And I tell students, this is your discussion with your peers. And, um, I, I respond to them one-on-one -on -one when I grade, and I will talk to them about their post, what they posted, and their responses to their classmates. That's how I do it. But you need to be clear with students how you're going to do that. And giving feedback, you always need to give them feedback every week. And uh, as, as much as I dislike grading, because it seems like that's all I do, giving students feedback on discussion posts uh, is, is a positive for me because if they're doing really well I push them I encourage them say you're doing great if they are uh, giving great feedback when they read their classmates posts and they're, they're you know asking them questions and those kind of things I encourage that I, I want students to to ask their classmates questions and then feedback also allows you to push those students who just aren't quite up to what you would like them to do uh, find something to say positive about what they wrote, but ask them for more so that, that, that they get discussions really going. Some other things you can do with discussion boards are set up a, a water cooler for random conversations. Uh, I don't have much success with that, but it's 
some topics might lend themselves better for that. I do have team discussions because I have classes that have teamwork and those work pretty well so that they can have their discussions within their team and other teams don't see them. So ways to engage them, uh, like I said, establish the criteria. What, what is going to be graded and how? So in mine, you know, the two paragraphs, I give them so many points for that. I give them so many points for each reply to their cl classmates. Um, I'm also going to start uh, encouraging students to ask questions of their classmates and then they would have to go back and answer those questions because that makes it more of a discussion instead of somebody just writing you know, four sentences that doesn't really carry the discussion forward. Uh, discussion board should move the discussion forward. Put your criteria in your syllabus. Make sure it's very clear. Yeah, I know students rarely read the syllabi, but you know, put it there anyway. And I also put the criteria for grading on the first and second discussion prompt. So it's right there and they know what's expected. Now, what kind of prompts should you have? Well, this depends on your subject matter, but try to have interesting ones, fun ones. Uh, you're going to be reading these, so why not, why not challenge them to think outside the box and to give you interesting stuff to read? Uh, I, I do a lot of observations, as I said, and I'll say things like, you know, compare and contrast the two people you observed. And that's why that's wide open and I get quite interesting things. Uh, so make sure you have some fun with them. And I mentioned before that I have videos. So give them some variety. A lot of students don't realize that there are TED Talks and YouTube videos that are educational. There are podcasts out there. Uh, they like audio video, so mix it up. Uh, Give them different things to think about. Like I said, I have students who, if they find a topic they really like, that in TED Talks it will give you uh, related ones, and they'll go and they'll watch three or four more. I, I think that's pretty exciting. So, how did we assess the interactions? Uh, we used this uh, Dreads LTI that was developed by Eastern Washington University, and it can show interactions, and it also would show isolation. And so I went through um, and looked at some of these. I'll show you what, what they look like. So here's one, and this shows the post, the student's post. So this one here, uh, DMS. So this is a larger one uh, that's because that has to do with the length. So this was a fairly long uh, response to the prompt. And then BM replied to DMS and MN replied, and then DMS replied to BM. Okay, that's that's a, a decent uh, discussion. Uh, over here to the top uh, right, you see CM is out here all by itself. Uh, that's because nobody responded. <laughs> uh, down here in the bottom middle left, you see that a person posted and then seven people responded, but nobody responded to any of the, the others. So this is how you can look at discussions and see um, what they look like. And the dark blue is the, is the person who posted the uh, response to the post. So I find these interesting that there are so many different uh, variations of how students reply. So the other uh, graphic that we can pull is this one, and this is called a chord. It's what they called it. And I don't know about you, but this looks crazy <laughs> to me. But you can see that interaction between students. And I tried to look over a term uh, to see if the same students were responding to the same students, and there was no consistency with that. But there is a good mix, I guess, of, um, of them discussing things with each other. So, um, Belda, can I uh, uh, add uh, to what you're yes, saying? Yes, please. So, folks, yes, please. Uh, if you look at, I, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse cursor, the thicker, uh, like for DMS, you see how that lots of information and communication going through. And, and it's really integrated, it goes back and forth and back and forth. So hopefully uh, 
we get a, an idea of how much information is being exchanged here. Thank you. Yeah, no, they couldn't see your cursor, but they can see mine, so I circled it around TMS. So, yeah, and then you see here MY has uh, the green going out, the purple coming in, the uh, pink coming in. So, just interesting, I think. So now to talk about our case study. So we looked at the discussion boards in six, six courses. The first three courses were hybrid. Um, we met face-to-face -face on weeks one, five, and 10. And uh, so those, since I teach here at Blue Mountain, we use Zoom. So some students were in the classroom weeks one, five, and 10. Some people were, were at the center, some people were at home. And so I had a, a wide variety. I finally went to uh, online 100% because the last two times I taught the courses, I was sitting in the room by myself and the students had learned that they could just watch the recording and they didn't have to show up. So I decided, why am I sitting in a classroom connected to centers all by myself? Uh, so I took it to online. So the prompts that we analyzed were the same throughout those terms. So there was no, uh, I didn't change them at all. And the average class size was 16 students per term. So the findings we had, uh, there was no difference in the discussions, uh, the student engagement between the hybrid and the online. Uh, what I found interesting was students were supportive and encouraging. There was no negativity. I, not that I expect negativity, but I, you would think every now and then there would be somebody who would be, you know, not super positive. But the students' comments were very supportive and encouraging. They provided personal uh, experiences. They shared some of the professional jobs that they've had or things that they've done. Uh, and they had so much detail. I was really surprised. I, and I probably shouldn't have been surprised because I've graded all of these. But when you look at it with a different lens and you're just looking at what is in here, it was very surprising to me that they had so much detail and they were willing to share their own experiences uh, with such detail. It was, it was just strange. Uh, the wording they used was positive. Yes, you want to say something? Oh, yeah, I was just uh, going to say it kind of uh, uh, goes hand in hand uh, with uh, what I uh, introduced earlier uh, in my section. Uh, when students have a better understanding of uh, uh, emotions and the discussion board, they should have more interest in participating and then they have, have a more positive attitude going into uh, the activities and, and actually be more engaging with other students. And uh, these findings of our case study demonstrate that. So one of the, I should mention, one of the uh, observations that they do is to observe two people having a discussion and to see if there's any empathy. And so right there, I guess I'm setting them up. <laughs> Not setting them up, but they're looking for empathy. And they either find it or they don't find it. And they're, they're very clear either way that they, yes, that it was there or no, it wasn't. And maybe that's why they get so detailed. Um, be able to be able to explain the empathy or the lack thereof. Uh, their wording was overly positive. Uh, and they were honest and, and open. I, that shocked me a bit that they were so honest and open with sharing about you know, things that they've done in the past that they shouldn't have done. I've had people talk about their kids and how you know, they, they didn't, they reacted to their kids instead of stopping and thinking. And uh, I just don't know if I would be that honest, but perhaps as you said, um, they, they're behind, they're not, yeah, they're creating who they want to be out there and you can't really see them, right? It's all in the process. Yeah, yeah. And so something else I noticed is that over the term, uh, students become comfortable with each other. They use the other students' names and their responses. Uh, I, I, I think that's cool that they would respond and, and use names. They also use some sarcasm and some humor. 
uh, um, it, that was interesting that they would, you know, somebody had said that they'd done something foolish or something, and somebody say, oh, don't feel bad, you know, I've done silly things like that, and then they would give their example. Um, yeah, it's a good yeah. kind of sarcasm and a good kind of humor we wanted. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that that comes through online in a in a written discussion board. I, yeah, I was just impressed with that. And overall, the things that they said to each other, they were very heartfelt. That was when I was reading the discussions with a, a you know analytical lens, was very heartfelt, very touching, and they seemed to be very sincere. Um, so. These are those little things you were talking about, right? Yeah. The, the little messages we take away. Yeah, and, and that those little things matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I'm gonna show you some charts since I made them. So <laughs> I looked at average uh, word count for discussion uh, through, and the weeks I looked at were weeks two, six, and nine, and I should probably tell you why I chose those. I didn't want week one because week one is everyone's learning and it's kind of a mess. I didn't want week 10 because then that's right before finals and everything's a mess. So that's why we did weeks two and nine. And I did week six because it's in between those two. And, um, and so I sort of thought that uh, the discussion word count, that the students would write more and more and more as the term went on. What I found is they write more in the middle on week six, but then it falls down at the end. And that could just be end of the term and they're stressed. You know, they do what they have to do, but I'm not going to do more. The only one that has a different pattern is this last summer. And I think that's interesting that it was really high at the beginning and then just tapered off. And I think that probably could be related to COVID and they were just exhausted. Wow. Okay, the other one I looked at was the average number of replies per student. So remember I told you that they have to post two paragraphs and then they have to read and respond to two others. Well, as a rule, that's what they did. Uh, yeah. And also, yeah. Uh, uh, David, uh, I, I saw, asked a question about uh, uh, student replies. So you may want to uh, take a closer look, David, uh, on this chart that might answer your question. Yeah, so the average um, average replies. So I do want to say here, uh, winter 2018, you see all of those are above two. Uh, when I was doing this analysis, I realized that a lot of the students in that course already knew each other. So they had already taken courses from me. Uh, I knew them fairly well. And these had been online courses. And so they were always um, above two, okay? They, they knew what I expected and they did it and they did it from, from week one. And they, I think they set the behavior for the rest of the students, right? So if everyone is doing this, we have to do this too. So. Okay. So I told you I looked at uh, some of the things that the students said and I went through and I just wrote down words that I was seeing that were in common. And I was shocked at how, how positive and encouraging they were. Uh, lots of students said, I agree, or I wholeheartedly agree, fully agree, whatever. I can relate, I understand, I get it. Uh, so <laughs> the one that, that a couple of them that touched me, it makes me happy. So you read something that somebody wrote and you write, it makes me happy. That, that is uh, validating to the person who wrote the original response, right? Um, you know, I hope things continue to improve. You know, that's just encouragement. Um, so the one that, the one, the honesty in your post is amazing the person who they were responding to is somebody who has social anxiety. I've had that student in class and that person has social anxiety. That person is um, shielded, has a hoodie on all the time, doesn't make eye contact, 
uh, and the person wrote something that was so genuine and so just amazing. And the first, and the person who responded said, "The honesty in your post is amazing." So you think about how that made that that student feel. The one who's so isolated and you know, has the social anxiety. Right. And again, uh, just look at all these quotes. Uh, by the way, these are all direct quotes from the students. Um, yes, they are. How positive they are and, and they're really in line uh, with uh, what uh, we discussed earlier on the sociological perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's, you know, if, if I, <clears throat> excuse me, if I wrote something and had somebody come back with these responses, I would feel validated. I would feel, I would feel good. I would feel great. <laughs> you know, it, it would be a good connection for me. So, uh, and, and I have to say, I've, I've read, I read a lot of student discussions and there are some that touch me. Uh, you know, this, this response made me off. So very cute. Anything else you want to say about any of these words? No, I think uh, we're good. Okay, so we'll move on to the lessons learned. The first one's pretty obvious. The students who post earlier in the week get more responses than the students who post later. Right, <laughs> always true. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when I showed you the, the one uh, graph with the uh, bubbles, so the one CM who was there all isolated, that one probably posted late, and so there was no time for anyone to post. That doesn't mean that that student really is isolated. If students know each other, they're going to be more engaged. So I was telling you about the winter 2018, that those students <clears throat> knew each other. And when I said, you know, that using each other's names, in their second week discussion, they used each other's names over 20 times. And that's pretty impressive uh, for, for, you know, second week of the term that group had over 20 uses every single week that they were always responding to each other with their names um and that that you know that builds that connection with with the other students and and as i said i noticed that they weren't just responding to the same people all the time they were bringing in the new people that, that they didn't know and using their names so building those connections and uh generally Students meet the course requirements. If I said two responses, I got two responses. Uh, there are very few students who are going to go out and do four. You know, she said two, I'm doing two. So, does this surprise you at all? No. Okay. So some final thoughts. And uh, this is exactly as you said. Uh, discussion boards allow students to feel included. They get to have that time where they can Put their thoughts together, write them down, trap them, you know, reword them, and then put the put out the words that they want to say. So it gives shy students, introverted students, all you know, non-native English speakers all time to get their words right and what they want to say. Same goes for their responses to other students. Okay, I want you to know that interaction is not engagement. Engagement is where they are talking to the other person that they're is that connection just posting great job wow nicely done that's not engagement that's that's interaction and we were wanting to know if it was a topic and the modality that determined how students if it was one or the other and i'm not sure that that's it i mean the topic of emotional intelligence may be uh, because i am making them think about their feelings making them think about empathy but I, I think it's more. I think it's their experience with discussion boards uh, out here at Blue Mountain. We have a lot of students that only take, can only take online courses. <clears throat> and so if they only take online courses, they're familiar with discussion boards. And that's what they know and, and that's how they connect. I think also the familiarity with the instructor, how the instructor's courses are set up and what the instructor's expectations are. If they're familiar with that, I think it makes them easy. They feel comfortable and they can get engaged quite easily. So I want to leave you with some student feedback. So here's one. 
in this course, I came in skeptical, which I believed helped me because it allowed me to think more objectively and helped me try on all sides rather than my opinion. I learned a lot in this class, learning a lot about the other people in the class through the discussions. So I didn't make this up. This is a direct quote. So, right? So it's those little things again, right? Young Sean? Little yes. things. Yes, yes. And got two more for you. Another important thing I learned is how to take time and try and understand a person to get to the real meanings of what they say and what they truly mean without judging them first. I thought that's really powerful, really powerful that, that they are not going to judge them in an online format. Um, and these are the kind of outcomes actually that uh, we were looking for. Um, and uh, yeah. apparently the students felt it and then they're benefiting from it. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is just feedback, you know, I just, I ask them at the end of the class, I say, you know, what, what have you learned? What are you going to take away? You know, I'm not, I, I don't say praise me and give me great, great stuff, but um, I just say, what are you going to take away? And these are the things that they write. So here's the last one. This class has also taught me that even if we are all different, everyone goes through similar situations. Whenever we had a discussion, I found myself amazed at how similar my classmates thought. That right there is that aha moment. And I had lots of, lots of feedback like that, uh, that I see other students think like me, they feel like me, I'm not alone. So, okay, time for your questions. Great, thank you both very much. Um, we, we did record a list of questions. Jerry, would you like to read them for Anna and Yosha? Uh, Valda, would you mind, uh, uh turning off the PowerPoint. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, did you ask me to read them? If you don't mind. <laughs> so uh, our first one is for Young Sheng from a sociologist perspective, what aspects of interaction need to be adapted when facilitating discussion in a mediated online environment versus face-to-face? -face. Aha. So uh, I mentioned uh, we have advantages, uh, certainly uh, obvious in my view, advantages for online discussions. Um, let's, let's face it, uh, this is not face-to-face -face anymore. We're all online, right? So even though there's no substitution for face-to-face, -face, uh, we have to find something that will substitute it the best we could. And online discussions is, is, uh, is what I've chosen to, to focus on. So as I mentioned before, uh, in, in sociology, we believe humans are just natural creatures. We have to communicate, you know, we, we just have to, socialize with each other uh, to gain meaning and to be productive and, 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 and functioning right and to feel sane and stuff. So with all that in mind, uh, to answer your question, so we'll have to try to find things to substitute what in a real life face-to-face -face situation would provide. So in face-to-face, -face, we want to encourage people to participate, right? And we want to encourage people to, to try to understand, you know, to have empathy and, and, and all. And, and to tell you the truth, I've taught online for over a decade. And of course, I taught face to face for over two decades. Uh, the best discussion I had was not face to face discussion. The best discussions I had were all online. Do you know why? It's because students have more time to think about the topic and they had more time to research and participate whenever they wanted and then everybody gets to participate and we have an unlimited amount of time literally not exactly but you know to some extent uh, versus the time the limited time we have in a face-to-face -face class you know uh, so so that's one thing i want to share with you 
if you have any specifics uh, regarding what I said, uh, feel free to ask me. And I think, you know, this is just my comment, it's not a question or anything, but I think it's been pointed out that, that some students are more likely to participate and to share in an online setting than they would in a face-to-face -face session, like Shire students or people that, that do need to take some time to uh, gather their thoughts. Absolutely. Thank you, Jerry. As I mentioned in my earlier uh, presentation, you know, like minor, minority groups, uh, uh, traditionally disadvantaged groups, you know, women, uh, you know, ESL students, uh, people who, who are, who, who, who do not speak English as a, as a first language and people who are introverts, people who are just shy, naturally shy, and online discussions works perfect for them. And, and they research and, and practice both demonstrate that. So we need to keep those things in mind oh. and utilize uh, the, the idea as well as uh, the method to see what we can do to maximize this online discussion uh, tool to draw students' interest and to maximize our uh, classroom uh, engagement. So, um, wait, wait, should I read the, the questioner's name or not? Um, I think you can read the first name. Okay, so Russ asks, uh, did you have an introductory discussion so students get to know each other initially? I think that might be for Velda, but maybe Yangcheng has. Yes, yes, I have that. I have that in all of my courses. Um, yes. And I, and I prompt them to tell me, you know, what's their major, what's their career goal? You know, tell me some hobbies so that we get to know them. Um, you know, hobbies are always fun. What do you What do you like to do in your free time? So this is my question: Do you do any other sort of community building or any other sort of um, sort of a follow up? Any other sort of uh, things to so so that they do get to know each other better? I think um, after week one, they just get to know each other better through the discussion boards. Okay. It, it really has to do with the class setting and the, with the instructor sometimes. Uh, but as long as students get over the first shy new phase, uh, they usually get pretty good. I, I also uh, do student introductions at the beginning of uh, the quarter for each class that I teach. And uh, that I have found has, has been very helpful. So we have a question from Christopher, and actually the first question was from Christopher also. If emotional intelligence is not part of the content of our course, how would you suggest helping students develop their emotional intelligence through online discussions? For example, in discussion guidelines, prompts, or feedback? Yeah, I would say it is what your prompts are. I mean, what kind of things are you doing in class? and what kind of activities or, or, you know, what are you having them do and then how you word, you know, how you word that prompt. You know, I mean, you could say, how did you feel when you were reading about the death of whoever in this novel we just read? Um, <laughs> that, that might be depressing, but, uh, you know, you, you can do that. I think one important thing to keep in mind is that we as uh, uh, educators should not just uh, uh, let it go to the students. We, uh, we need to be constantly on the discussion with the students. We need to moderate it, we need to direct it, and we need to put in whatever, whenever is required, uh, our feedback to kind of gear students uh, you know, towards the right path if they somehow wander around. And once again, uh, at the beginning, it, it may take some extra effort, but once the, the path is set, everything you know goes downhill, becomes easy. Yeah, I've never had wandering around. Jerry, do you have more questions? Yes. Uh, Russ asks, uh, in classroom discussions, participants can choose to initiate perspectives or react to other people's perspectives? 
uh, can we allow participants whether they want to initiate or react? And uh, sure. I think earlier you said that you prefer to have um, the initial posting and then the students are reacting. Uh, so I, I guess he may be asking, can we allow the other, other way around? Oh, sure, but it's going to be messy to follow. So remember when I showed the bubbles? So, you know, if somebody responds to the prompt uh, initiating something, then that's going to be within that, that thread. But I think if you have, uh, yeah, you're going to want to try to keep it tidy. Okay. So actually, I'm going to jump uh, to, it was not exactly a question. There's, so we're, we, we're at comments now. And I'm going to jump to something that was not exactly a question, but, but, but um, Jaylene asked have, about uh, using audio and video in discussion boards, allowing students to submit audio or video discussion uh, posts if, uh, if they prefer that than using text. Yes. Have either of you tried that? Yes, I have. Uh, I always have audio and video as an option. I've only had two classes where students did that, and it was okay. not the emotional intelligence video, or emotional intelligence course. Um, so, most students want to write. So did you prompt them to do that, or did they just notice it themselves how to do that? Well, no, I tell them that you can do either written or audio or video, and they except for the two courses, they were leadership courses, different leadership courses, uh, except for those two courses, students have not done that. In all my classes, I have audio and video as part of a discussion, but for some reason, studio, students just don't do that. Yeah, some, some, some faculty, some teachers do require that students post a video in, in, in a particular discussion. Although, yeah. as was pointed out, I think some of you were at the Northwest eLearn last year and uh, Flower Darby had a very, very emotional instance of a student who didn't post a video for, you know, for re personal reasons because because of bad things that were happening in her life. And so it's something that we, we have to keep, you know, be aware of and maybe and give people the option to do something alternative. Right, I agree. So some comments. Um, Russ says perhaps it's not topic or modality, it's the degree to which they're emotionally engaged with the topic. That could be. Thank you. So perhaps uh, the suggestion is to, to have topics that are emotionally engaging. <laughs> um, another comment. Sorry, I was just thinking about history and I was, I was thinking about history and I'm like, oh, that could be, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, it could that could be that could be a can of worms too, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Christopher says, I think sharing with students the importance of the discussions, not just for the grade, but to acknowledge the possibilities of how students may grow by participating in discussions and why. Uh, I agree, Christopher. I learned years ago uh, teaching that when I got assignments just for me and I would have students write things just for me, I was learning a ton from my students. And that's when I decided we need to have the discussion boards so that students can learn from each other. Exactly. And one more, I think uh, it's like uh, Weiwei's getting on, uh, ready to take over. But uh, Kathleen uh, said, I think this was Kathleen, it looked like it got a little merged into something else. The vision to, so to speak, and acknowledging the isolation that may occur within COVID and online. Uh, okay, so maybe I, I might have put a carriage return in there, chopping something up. Thanks so much. Right, Jeff. I think acknowledging it is important though, for our students. Sorry, wait, wait, go ahead. No, I was just saying thank you, Jerry, for organizing all the notes in the back end, and it's it's been busy here. <laughs> okay, um, I'm watching the time. We have one minute left, probably 30 seconds. Thank you very much to both of you, Velda and Yongsheng, for the excellent session and also helping us wrapping up this year's series. 
this officially marks the end of the conference year 2020, and I've concluded my term as a chair. Um, if you saw our September announcements, um, you would know Anya, uh, Anna is our chair for 2021. So Anna, would you like to say a few words? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending and, and uh, to the presenters for this wonderful presentation. Uh, so just a, a couple announcements. Uh, we have a journal that will be coming out next year. The deadline is the 31st of this month for the May 2021 publication. Also, watch for upcoming monthly newsletter announcements throughout the year, uh, including any conference plans for 2021 that we will announce after the board has made a decision. Also, you may join our uh, community in the Slack work, uh, workspace, or you may sign up for our email announcements if you like. And I posted some links on the ch in the chat uh, for our website, for information about the journal and the community page so to join Slack or uh, add your email as a subscription. Thank you.